All right, good afternoon or good evening to those on the East Coast and good morning to those joining us from Taiwan or elsewhere in the Asia Pacific. Uh, I am Karis Templeman. I'm the program manager of the Hoover Program on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and it is my pleasure today uh, to moderate uh, an event with our featured speaker, uh, Jacques de Lille. Um, the topic for today is something that's been in the news quite a bit uh, in res with respect to uh, U.S.-Taiwan relations, uh, and that is Taiwan's international status, U.S. policy towards Taiwan, and uh, the changing and possibly uh, fundamentally different approach of the late Trump administration, early Biden administration towards Taiwan uh, policy and interaction with Taiwan uh, government officials uh, as compared to uh, the approaches of previous administrations. And so I can think of no one better to speak about the kind of complicated tangle of international laws and precedents and priorities uh, involving Taiwan than Jacques Delisle, um, who is the Stephen A. Cozen Professor of Law and Professor of Political Science and the director of the Center for the Study of Contemporary China at the University of Pennsylvania. Jacques uh, has been a longtime scholar of uh, international law, but also specifically Taiwan's place in international law. His research and teaching has focused on contemporary Chinese law and politics, uh, including legal reform and its relationship to economic reform and political change in China the international status of Taiwan and cross-strait relations, uh, China's engagement with the international order, legal and political issues in Hong Kong under Chinese rule, and of course, US-China relations as well. Uh, his writings on these subjects have appeared in a variety of fora around the world, uh, including international relations journals, edited volumes, Asian studies journals, as well as law reviews. Uh, so Jacques really is kind of a multidisciplinary savant here. Uh, and uh, he is also a professor of political science, uh, the director of the Center for East Asian Studies at Penn, deputy director of the Center for the Study of Contemporary China, and the director of the Asia program at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. So he carries a significant administrative burden as well as his teaching and research obligations. Um, he has served frequently as well as an expert witness on issues of PRC law and government policies. And he is a consultant lecturer and advisor to legal reform, development, and education programs, primarily in China. Um, I'm really pleased today we have uh, Dr. Delil to talk to us about Taiwan's uh, international status in U.S.-Taiwan relations. Um, a note on procedure before I turn the floor over to Jacques. Uh, we will have about 25 minutes for question and answer uh, after uh, he is done speaking. I invite the audience to submit your question via the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Uh, I can't promise we'll get to all the questions, but I will at least see them all and uh, we'll moderate a discussion following the formal uh, remarks that our speaker has prepared. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Professor DeLeo. Well, thank you, Karis. Thank you for the kind introduction. And it's uh, great to see the people on my screen, which is Karis and, and Larry Diamond, who uh, of course is uh, the impresario of this, this whole enterprise. Uh, I always love going to Hoover. I wish I could be doing it uh, physically rather than, than by Zoom, but perhaps someday in the future we'll be able to do that all again. Well, as Kara said, uh, US-Taiwan relations have been in the news a lot lately, uh, and they're in quite good shape by any estimation. And for uh, everyone in the audience who I suspect follows these things, we've been hearing positive things about the relationship for quite some time. Uh, during the Ma ying presidency, of course, Ma suggested that the relations were the best they'd been since before the end of formal diplomatic relations in 1979. Uh, and Tsai, I think, has accurately characterized them as perhaps even better now. There's been obviously a, a, a big turn uh, in, in the US side of this relationship. Uh, if we think back to the start of the Trump administration, even before the start of it, there was the famous phone call between then President-elect Trump and President Tsai, 
which uh, suggested that the one China policy might be up for grabs. That came after the phone call, but it looked like uh, perhaps a big uptick in US engagement with Taiwan. Now that little episode turned out to be something of fool's gold or a sugar high, it created a bit of a problem. We saw uh, some backtracking uh, uh, from, from any suggestion that it was a fundamental change in policy. But once we got through that and, and Trump's swing back in the other direction, which suggested that he would clear things with Xi Jinping before another phone call, we settled into what I think was an uptick in an already good relationship. So there are a lot of things that have been going on for four years now under Trump, and I think heading into the Biden administration, that suggest continuity in a strong uh, US-Taiwan relationship and US support. So you can see many statements about how strong the relationship is and see them on both sides. Uh, you've had remarkable moments like the congratulation on size election and re-election, and in the second case, the re-election actually coming from the Secretary of State, Pompeo, which is a very high level approval. We see the grand new space of the AIT uh, offices in, in Taiwan, which look a lot like the opening of a big deal American embassy. And you can go through all the issue areas and see signs of strength, uh, defense cooperation, security cooperation, uh, large and regular arms sales, a lot of trips by the US Navy and freedom of navigation operations near Taiwan and transit passage to the Strait. These are all signals of of security support, lots of positive statements, the Shangri-La dialogue by US secretaries of defense, and some pretty pointed pushback on what the US has characterized as rising Chinese intimidation and coercion aimed at Taiwan. And we also saw in the last few years, Taiwan being folded into the US uh, security structure in the Western Pacific. The, the free and open Indo-Pacific policy explicitly included Taiwan in a way that it hadn't been included in, um, in uh, Obama era and earlier approaches uh, to security in the region. On the economic side, the TIFA talks return, the Trade and Investment Framework Agreements. And we just recently over the summer had the Great Rack Topamine Breakthrough, uh, where uh, President Tsai Ing-wen said that, uh, that Taiwan would, would finally uh, address the, the issue of excluding US pork and beef exports to Taiwan, which of course are not economically important, but domestic politics of agriculture is a big deal in both countries. So that's a fairly uh, significant breakthrough and it potentially opens the way uh, toward progress uh, toward a bilateral trade agreement, which Taiwan earnestly wants. Although of course, uh, the economic picture has its difficulties too. That agreement's hardly within reach and Taiwan is caught in some rather difficult challenges with a few opportunities uh, in the US-China trade plus war and, and tech wars. And you look at things like the global cooperation uh, uh, training framework, the GCTF, which dates to 2015, a little before Trump, but it's it's been growing bigger. It's a higher profile, it's increasingly multilateral, it's better funded, and it's an opportunity for Taiwan to showcase its value strengths, helping with democracy, helping with humanitarian relief and other things in the region. The level of US visits has gone up. The formal cap has, was formally lifted at the end of the Trump administration. We saw Alex Azar going on a sort of COVID themed visit to celebrate Taiwan's successes there. And that's the highest level visitor, at least since Gina McCarthy when she was EPA administrator in, in uh, 2014, but, but actually secretary is you know, somewhat more exalted status, so that's pretty big. And we saw a planned, although scuttled visit by the US UN ambassador right at the end of the Trump term. We've also seen Congress get into the act. Uh, anyone who watches the Taiwan issue has seen Congress almost legislate in a pro-Taiwan way for many, many years. But in the last four years, we've got an alphabet suit, the TTA, the Taipei Act, the, the uh, ARIA, the, well, I'll get to some of them later, but a lot of legislation that essentially says the US should do more to support Taiwan. And the early signs from the Biden administration, I think are mostly toward continuity in this strong relationship. There, have, there were concerns, very audible in Taiwan, that we might see some backsliding toward early to mid Obama era uh, positions, partly because Biden himself, of course, and many, many of his team are Obama era veterans. Uh, but uh, I think the Biden folks have been working pretty hard to send signals of continued strong support. So if you look at the campaign uh, period interview with uh, Shi Jinping, uh, World Journal that Biden gave, which said, we'll stand with friends and allies to advance our shared prosperity, security, and values in the Asian Pacific. And that includes deepening ties with Taiwan, a leading democracy, and so on. Uh, you saw uh, Xiaobi Kim, the ambassador equivalent, invited to the inauguration 
uh, once we cleaned up the Capitol a little bit after the events of January 6th, nice little inauguration. Uh, we also saw the statement from the State Department quite early on in 2021 that describes Taiwan as being among the friends and allies in the region with which the U.S. is going to deepen ties and declaring the U.S. commitment to Taiwan to be rock solid and expressing concern about the ongoing Chinese attempts to intimidate neighbors, including Taiwan. And most recently, we have the readout of the Xi Biden two hour phone call, which pointedly, especially in the US version, the readout criticizes the PRC's increasingly assertive actions in the region, including toward Taiwan. And both of those statements are, in a sense, a response to what looks to have been Beijing's attempt to test Biden early on by ratcheting up still further military maneuvers around Taiwan. And I think all of this comes in the context of the Biden administration's broader commitment to cooperating with regional allies and friends and like-minded states to sort of repair the unilateralism or America first uh, ally alienating uh, policies of Trump. So that's kind of my, my quick overview of what's happening. Now let me get a little more um, uh, structured in the analysis here and suggest that, that these are likely to be, I think, durable changes. They have roots in developments that were occurring uh, before Trump, and I, I think that, that although there's going to be a real change in style and some changes around the edges, uh, that we're going to see a fair amount of continuity. Partly that credit goes to Taiwan. Uh, Tsai Ing-wen has made it very clear that she is not interested in provoking a crisis. That was what Tsai managed to convince Americans of on the eve of her 2016 election, but she had not managed to do on the eve of her 2012 uh, failed bid for the presidency. Uh, so Taiwan is not going to do something to trigger the entrapment dynamic in alliance politics, where the U.S. is going to get drawn into a crisis of Taiwan's making in the cross-strait areas. More importantly, U.S.-China relations are in a very different place than they were early to mid-Obama administration. So it's not that you should worry, uh, if you're Taiwan, about uh, everybody who's a veteran of that administration returning to prior positions. They are the same people, but dealing with a very different conception of US-China relations. Taiwan no longer looks like the most likely cause of a needless crisis in a basically good US-China relationship. Instead, it's a pretty bad relationship. There's a consensus that constructive engagement is over. We're not sure what's replacing it. I think there's a lot less consensus there, but it's a tougher line on China and a belief that solving the Taiwan problem, as Beijing likes to call it, uh, would not, uh, on, on any terms acceptable to China, would not really fix uh, what ails the US-China relationship. So Taiwan, again, looks as it has at times in the past as a hard power asset and a soft power asset in a more uh, conflict-prone or, or at least rivalrous US-China relationship. In short, US-China relations have changed, and that's a big part of why the Obama people uh, back in power, I think, have a rather different view of how to approach Taiwan and, relatedly, uh, China. So the fears of a backslide to early Obama policies strike me as misplaced. Uh, and uh, sort of uh, um, correspondingly to that, some of the uh, striking enthusiasm unusual among Democratic friends uh, for the Trump reelection prospects in Taiwan, I think they were based on, on that possible uh, misreading. So let me turn now to, to, to what I, th I think, uh, the, how this all feeds into question of questions of Taiwan's um, international status. A lot of what um, Taiwan's relations with the US when they're strong do for Taiwan and many of the specific policy elements in US Taiwan policy are basically important well, for many reasons, but one reason they're important is they are key supports for Taiwan's quest for international space status and in turn security. And uh, there's been an old, long, ongoing, at least back to the uh, early days of Taiwan's democratic era, strategy that Taiwan has pursued to try to grab that international space and status and security it, it brings. Uh, and the US has at times, as it is now again, I think, uh, helping significantly on that front. And I would say the strategy includes a few strands. Uh, the first one focuses on relations with states in the international system. Part of that is formal diplomatic relations. Well, Taiwan's down to about 15. They lost about a third of their then remaining diplomatic allies after Tsai came to power. That's because of Beijing's moves. So why does it matter to have relations with 15 or so uh, small, not very consequential in the international system countries? Well, there are a few reasons. One is uh, international law tells us that states have to have four characteristics, territory, population, 
government in the sense of self-government governance and not answering to anybody else. Taiwan's got those three in spades. The fourth one is the capacity to engage in international relations. And one of the indicators of that is having formal diplomatic ties. Maybe not hugely important, and the disjunction between international law and international politics is not trivial, uh, but it still matters uh, to do the things that get one state or state-like status. Uh, to put it somewhat crudely, uh, if Saddam is going to go nuts, you're better off being Kuwait than you are being the Kurds. If you're dealing with China, you're better off being Taiwan than you are being Hong Kong, and you're better off being Hong Kong than you are being Xinjiang. So to get this kind of uh, recognition and status in the international system uh, matters a great deal, and diplomatic allies help. More mundanely, diplomatic relations help keep Taiwan visible in the international system. Uh, they get, Taiwan gets support in international organizations. Its issues get brought up at the UN and elsewhere. The president of the ROC gets to do head of state or head of government-like visits. Uh, and gets to transit through the US and the opportunities that brings to meet with political leaders, officials, and the public. So what's happened here on this front has not been great for Taiwan in the last few years. Again, with the end of the Ma era diplomatic truce, uh, during his tenure only, Taiwan only lost one uh, diplomatic ally, the Gambia. They left Taiwan and then switched to China in the lame duck period, period of, of Ma's presidency. Uh, but since then, Taiwan has lost essentially one third, and it's down to only one in the developed world, one in Europe, one in Africa. So it's basically small Latin American and oceanic uh, countries. U.S. policy has been modestly supportive on this front, but only modestly supportive. So we saw the Trump administration call back ambassadors from the Latin American, Central American countries have switched. Some pressure brought to bear on the Solomon Islands, Pence canceled the meetings, and some cage rattling about assistance. And the Taipei Act passed by Congress calls for a series of carrots and sticks to press countries that have uh, the relations that we don't have with Taiwan to keep them. And the Biden uh, administration, I think, is more or less keeping in this lane. Uh, the emphasis on an alliance of, or at least an alignment of democracies in the Indo-Pacific, like-minded states, uh, signals uh, support on, on this front. And um, uh, it's been warmly embraced, embraced by President Tsai and by Foreign Minister Wu. And indeed, uh, Joseph Wu had to at one point say, we're not seeking formal diplomatic ties with the US. Things have gotten so good that, that there was even some churning on that front. There are, of course, constraints. The US isn't going to go to formal uh, recognition. How bad is the diplomatic squeeze for Taiwan? Well, it's not great, but I don't think it's dire for a few reasons. One is it's not in Beijing's self-interest to squeeze Taiwan too hard. Uh, because if you corner someone, they may lash out in ways that are not terribly uh, conducive to stability that at least for now Beijing is tolerating. But more to the point, there's no magic number. It's not, not that you have to have double digits. Uh, you know, where, so losing a couple more, losing a few more is not uh, transformative. Uh, but I think the bigger issue here is that if Beijing squeezes Taiwan too hard on that front, Taiwan has a code switching option to say, okay, fine, no more diplomatic relations, but look how robust our informal relations are and how strong they are with the US and Japan and things of that ilk. And it can trade on the ambiguity of what counts in international law and politics as the capacity to engage in international relations. And on the informal side, Taiwan's quite strong. So let's switch to the informal side. I'll focus here on the US because that is Taiwan's most important informal bilateral relationship, of course. We could talk about Japan, we could talk about others. Uh, why does this matter? Well, it's probably too obvious to say. Um, on the more formal uh, aspect of, of informal relations, uh, the international law that says capacity to engage in international relations is ambiguous about how much is uh, formal and informal. And, and obviously this is a, a big one on the informal side. Um, but there's also, I think, the, the fundamental point that the informal quasi-alliance relationship with the U.S. is an important uh, external support for Taiwan security in all the obvious ways. Uh, so much so that, of course, that's what draws the ire of Beijing. Complaints about the U.S. interfering in China's internal affairs, possibly fomenting secession and so on. Uh, as an aside here, I'll note there's a wonderfully complicated set of international law issues here about what, when and when it is not permissible uh, to transfer arms and to uh, engage in things that affect uh, politics. It has a lot to do with what you think of as secession versus what you think of as um, coercion of an already uh, independent entity. So what's happened on this front is, as I said at the top of my remarks, things are going pretty well in terms of the informal U.S.-Taiwan relationship. 
grew a lot under uh, Trump and is likely to, I think, to continue under Biden. Here, though, it's, it's movement within a not terribly broad band when things are good. US law and policy, I would say, here sets a relatively high floor and a not too high ceiling. And we're toward the relatively high end of that, uh, that, that range. So the Taiwan Relations Act, the foundational document here, assumes and reinforces a robust in, a set of informal relations. No formal diplomatic relations, no mutual security treaty, but robust informal ones, the AIT and TECRO as substitutes for embassies, uh, quasi-diplomatic uh, quasi -diplomatic relations, sovereign immunity, a bunch of as-if treatments. So without, without grappling explicitly or, or taking on the sovereignty question, it creates as a matter of US law, treatment of Taiwan as if it were a state uh, whose government had formal diplomatic relations. And of course, there are robust informal security relations built in here with the arms sales provision of the TRA. Of the three sacred texts of US-Taiwan relations, sorry, the four sacred texts, it's like the, the gang of four, right? Now's the time. Uh, of the, of, the, of the, the sacred texts of US-Taiwan relations, the three communiques and the TRA, the TRA is the most pro-Taiwan, uh, not surprisingly, it's unilateral, it's not negotiated with China. And it is also the most binding on US behavior. Uh, it's a slightly formal point, but the TRA is congressional legislation. It is binding on the president, whereas the three communiques are merely, in the US view, policy statements that the president uh, could change uh, on a whim. In China's view, in Beijing's view, they are binding international legal treaty commitments. The US doesn't see them that way. But even if the US did see them that way, the president has the authority to tear up any treaty arrangement. We know that from the case of Goldwater v. Carter, which was a challenge to the 1979 ending of the US-Taiwan uh, Mutual Security Treaty. Uh, so uh, the part of US law or US policy in this area that matters most um, is, is one that's, that, that bakes in a fairly strong uh, informal relationship. Recent legal developments, legislative developments have been positive, as I, I said at the top, but I'll say a little more about it now. If you go through the National Defense Authorization Acts the last several years, the Taiwan Travel Act, the Asian Reassurance Initiative Act, the Taipei Act, the Taiwan Assurance Act, and, and others, what do they do? Well, again, positive, but with limits. It's striking that they were actually adopted since many other similar pieces of legislation died in Congress over the years. But they're mostly restatements of existing policy and law. They reaffirm the three communiques, the TRA, the six assurances, and so on. They declare Congress's policy preferences, but those aren't law, those are policy preferences. They um, impose some reporting and study requirements on the executive branch, but they don't really do much more than urge the president to be more robust in his support and engagement. Uh, with Taiwan to call for higher level visits, port calls, more regular and robust arms sales, support for international organization participation, and so on. Um, if, or to the extent that they might purport to give the president more authority, the president is free not to use it. Um, uh, so far, we've seen some signs of using it, higher level visits, and so on. And if, they, if there were an attempt to really constrain the president on these matters, uh, we'd get into US separation of powers analysis, which would say, well, foreign affairs, defense commitments, those are largely presidential choices. So they're really important signaling, but they don't purport to, and if they purported to, they couldn't uh, do a ton to transform uh, the strong but still informal relationship. I think it's worth noting in this context, the special treatment the six assurances have gotten. This was the, the codicil uh, to the third communique, the third communique, uh, which is a degree of commitment on reducing arms sales under certain conditions. The six assurances basically told Taiwan not to worry too much about that Reagan era document. Um, but what's happened in, in, in recent months is they've been declassified. We all knew what they were, but declassification is an important symbolic move. move. And now they're embedded in this legislation. The legislation explicitly refers to six assurances and tries to raise that particularly pro-Taiwan, as it were, document uh, to a higher uh, status, a deeper degree of entrenchment. The, uh, the second big cluster of things that Taiwan does to, uh, to enhance and secure its international status, um, so I've been talking about relations with states, the second one is engagement with international organizations and institutions. This is another key source of international status. If you want to be state or state-like, it's important to do what states do, 
uh, and that means uh, being part of international institutions and regimes. There are, of course, vitally important practical things here. Taiwan gains from being in the WTO, it gains from access to the WHO and things like that. Uh, but for the status purposes, it's important. Core UN membership is, of course, not attainable. That went away with UN Resolution 2758, reassigning the Chinese seat from Taipei to Beijing. And the US does not support Taiwan getting into states member only organizations. That's built into the Clinton era three no's, it's built into the broader one China policy. Uh, and the UN is generally seen as in that uh, category. Now, we could, have, we could have a little sidebar argument here about whether the UN is indeed a states member only organization. The Palestinian Authority gets strong observer status. The Soviets used to have three seats, uh, even though it was clearly uh, one state. Uh, but by and large, that barrier is insurmountable, and we know that for certain in U.S.-Taiwan relations because of Chen Shui-bian's ill-fated uh, on the way out the door referendum in 2008 on whether Taiwanese uh, voters supported seeking U.N. membership under the name Taiwan, a, a referendum that the U.S. Uh, then slapped back on pretty hard in the person of Tom Christensen, then the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, with relevant responsibility. So the UN's out of the box, but what about UN specialized bodies? There are 15 of them. Uh, and here Taiwan uh, scored some success. The big one, of course, was the WHA access, uh, annual attendance at the WHA, the World Health Assembly, which is the annual plenary session of the WHO's members. Uh, this was part of what Beijing was willing to tolerate as rapprochement cross-strait proceeded in the Ma years. And it was partly the fallout of China having handled SARS so badly. It took a few years, but the idea that Taiwan was a frontline uh, society that had been hit hard by SARS made that argument easier. The US supported it. Uh, but of course, China has blocked Taiwan's participation since 2017, which is to say really the beginning of the Tsai administration. Yeah, the 2016 was after Tsai was in office, but the invitation had gone to the Ma administration. Similar story, sorry, and despite the COVID problem, which in many ways echoes the SARS problem, uh, Taiwan has not been able to get back to the WHA in 2020. Um, similar story with the International Civil Aviation Organization where Taiwan got a one-off uh, invitation to the Triennial Assembly has not been repeated. Tell similar stories about the UN uh, 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 framework Convention on Climate Change and the, uh, the uh, uh, Conference of Parties, similar story with Interpol. On all of these fronts, uh, Taiwan had made from almost no gains to significant gains, and post-2016, uh, there have been significant losses. And I would say these losses actually have gotten more consequential. Being excluded from the WHA is a bigger deal as we live with COVID uh, than it might have been before that. Uh, the ICAO becomes a little more significant when, uh, when Beijing is pushing the issue of the de facto uh, tolerated median line in the strait. ICAO doesn't apply to military aircraft, but we saw an opening of the civilian flight path. It's clearly pushing harder. And as the climate crisis grows worse, and as we see in the case of Interpol, we see Taiwanese ROC nationals being sent to China uh, for a possible prosecution for international crime. These are all uh, regimes, the exclusion from which is, is not just symbolically, but practically significant for Taiwan. With other international organizations, Taiwan's had more success, especially those in the economic sphere where statehood is not a requirement for membership. Uh, we see this particularly in things like the WTO, APEC, the Asian Development Bank. Yes, there's some marginalization, there's some unfortunate nomenclature that makes you wonder what the independent customs territory of Taiwan, Pong, Hu, Jimin, and Mazu is, but you know, it's, it's, it's at least a, a chance to be fully at the table. Uh, Taiwan's been less successful in the new and emerging one. So another sign of some downward uh, trends here in that uh, uh, getting into the TPP, uh, which Taiwan had hoped to do in a second round, that isn't gonna happen in part because the US opted out of the TPP and therefore lost the leverage to support Taiwan. The RCEP is controlled by Beijing, no way Taiwan's getting into that. A uh, similar story with the AI, IB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. So in this context, US support uh, has been there. It's been fairly robust uh, with some of the legislation and, and uh, administrative administration positions that I alluded to earlier. And here Taiwan may gain something under the Biden administration simply because of the administration's commitment to re-engaging with some of the international organizations that Trump exited, such as the WHO or the Paris Accords, or that it undermined, such as the WTO, by not allowing appointment of judges, 
or that, that we might decide to re-engage uh, or rejoin, such as the uh, TPP and probably the UN Human Rights Council as well. Third and finally, uh, Taiwan has pursued a strategy for space and security that I would describe as as if participation. Uh, this is kind of like uh, kids in a sandbox parallel play. That is, Taiwan is not allowed to join major treaty regimes, particularly those centered on, on UN-based treaties, uh, for the same reason they can't get better access to the UN. But what Taiwan does is act as if it were a member. Uh, it, it takes on all the obligations uh, and uh, follows the rules of the organizations and, and shows its uh, performance of the obligations that would come with membership. Obviously, this is another way of, of acting and looking like a state in the international system. It also allows to play to status quo uh, and sometimes aspirational values that portray Taiwan as a good international citizen, something we've seen in COVID and other contexts. Here, there are a bunch of regimes one could look at uh, because I'm running short on time here. I'll just give you one example, which is the human rights regime. And here from Lin Danghui through Tsai Ing-wen, uh, we've seen Taiwan's presidents and many other leaders stress Taiwan's performance, saying Taiwan measures up to the requirements of the two principal human rights covenants, the Civil and Political Rights Covenant and the, um, uh, and the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights one. And uh, under Ma, Taiwan tried to submit instruments of ratification, of course, rejected by the UN. And Ma says, look, no change. Taiwan still got the obligation. And Taiwan has then behaved as if it were a member, adopting, implementing legislation, issuing quadrennial reports on Taiwan's performance. Tsai has expanded that to additional UN human rights treaties and establishing a domestic human rights commission, which finally came to fruition during Tsai's term. And here, the, the key is to Taiwan showing uh, not only that it uh, is behaving as if it were a state in good standing in these, in these treaties, but also showing international good citizenship, support for a rules-based international order, and pointedly contrasting with China's not so great performance on, on some of these uh, human rights uh, metrics. The US role here has been, again, one of general support for Taiwan's international participation. Uh, the human rights and democracy prong resonates with the value strand in US foreign policy. And here, I think we're seeing a re-emphasis on the not freedom of religion parts of, uh, of uh, the US uh, human rights agenda uh, in foreign policy. And you've seen a lot of praise from official US sources for Taiwan's accomplishments. And I think you know, we may see some more uptick here uh, with the Biden administration's emphasis on democracies and like-minded countries and the plan to re-engage the Human Rights Council at the UN. You could tell similar stories about the public health regime. I could put the WHO, WHA discussion in this part of the talk. You can see something similar with the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, and so on. So in closing, um, I would just say that Taiwan today continues in its long-running, challenging, chronically fraught quest for international status, that that quest entails playing a complex game of international politics and international law, walking right up to the pink fringes of the red line of declaring sovereign state status in a way that, that, that uh, Beijing will react uh, violently to. That US support is a key asset for Taiwan that recently has been strengthened under Trump and likely to continue under Biden. But there are other factors in the landscape that Taiwan faces that are less favorable and that have become worse due to pressure or recalcitrance from Beijing primarily. So Taiwan today is playing a relatively weak hand but playing it well in a difficult and in some ways increasingly difficult uh, game with significant but limited and at times uneven support from the United States. Great. Wonderful, Jacques. That was uh, a tour de force. Really. Um, I want to start our conversation by asking a question specifically about the changes that the U.S. has made to our own policy approach to Taiwan, and in particular, the, uh, the I don't know whether to call it an abolition or a rollback or a suspension or elimination of the remaining restrictions on formal U.S. Uh, Taiwan uh, interaction at an official level uh, that Pompeo announced. Um, and I wonder how far the U.S. can or will go to roll back a lot of what have been self-imposed restrictions, uh, but restrictions nonetheless on our kind of inter our, our official interaction with our Taiwan counterparts. Uh, how far the US will go before it provokes 
a real reaction from Beijing. So to use the language that you just uh, quoted here or that you just proposed, uh, how far, how close are we to crossing? Are we in the pink fringes of the red lines that Beijing uh, has drawn out? And what happens if we do get to the red part? Does Beijing, <laughs> uh, what options do they have? You know, um, and, and just to lay my own cards out on the table, I, I personally think they've thrown away a lot of leverage. They've wasted a lot of leverage by not finding a way to cooperate with Tsai Ing-wen early on. Uh, they've twisted a lot of screws and don't have a whole lot to show for it. And now they're in a situation where the US is actually making some significant changes that in the past would have produced some serious blowback, but the relationship is so poor between the US and China now that those, those consequences don't have the same weight that they would have previously. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I, so there are a few pieces to that question. I don't think uh, Pompeo did the Biden administration any favors uh, by that blanket lift. I think if you want to uh, to play in that space, and there are, there are good reasons to want to do that, you're better off doing it kind of bit by bit. So sending Azar is one thing, you know, sending uh, the UN uh, ambassador to another, you can just do it. And, and, and much of the game here, and what, what can disarm Beijing to some degree, is you have a dual use visit. So you didn't send Azar just because it was, we're going to send somebody with the title secretary, take that Beijing. It was, look, COVID's a big problem here. Taiwan's done great. We want to cooperate. And, so, and you, you have an economic occasion to send the secretary of commerce or, or reverse flows. So you find ways to send that signal of support, that incremental ratcheting up of, of Mian, the sort of face for Taiwan in, in, in informal context without announcing it as a big policy. Um, but I, I also agree with your, your, your description of what's going on with, with Beijing. I think there are a few issues. One is when something is, it, it, when, when the relationship is this bad, going to the bar one more night is not going to ingratiate you anymore. With you, it's not going to hurt your relationship with your spouse anymore, right? That is, uh, that is, in some sense, there's so many bad things going on in the US-China relationship that, um, that one more provocative thing is not going to provoke that much of a reaction. And I think one constant that goes back well before uh, Trump and I think has run throughout um, US policy, at least for most of Taiwan's democratic era, I'd take it at least back to Li Donghui, is that the US in effect sits in judgment on a crisis in cross-strait relations. And the US decides who's at fault and basically leans toward the other side. So when the US saw Chen Shui-bian as provoking needless crises, Basically, Beijing and, and Washington almost co-managed the problem. Now, the view is that Tsai has been moderate by any standard and has been as moderate as a DPP president could possibly be. And Beijing has just thrown an escalating temper tamper um, and, and increased the pressure and the coercion. So it's like you know, there's, there's just a sense that, that they're, we're already bearing whatever costs they are. And uh, there's kind of a hydraulic logic. If Beijing squeezes the U.S., backs Taiwan a bit more. And this is a relatively um, uh, benign way of, of, of doing it. But yeah, I think this is a case where um, there are times when one could say that Chinese foreign policy occasionally never misses an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Uh, but it's not the first time we've seen that. We saw, uh, we've seen, we saw, you know, Chen Shui-bian early in both of his terms uh, make partial openings. You know, it's, it's a long story, but th this is a, this is, I think, a more extreme version. Um, and, uh, you know, it looks like the, the position from Beijing has been to wait outside and hope for a more pliable uh, successor, but, you know, that's not necessarily a great bet to make right now. Yeah, in fact, uh, chances are, given public opinion, uh, the next successor, if it's a DPP successor, is going to be more pro-independence than the current one. And if, if it's, it's a DPP like successor, uh, they're facing long odds, but even they, will be pulled in a direction that Beijing doesn't like if they want to win the election. So yeah, I really think Beijing's, uh, I'd, I'd agree with you, Beijing's strategy doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, uh, so next I want to turn to uh, Larry Diamond to pose a question. Uh, thank you for that great talk, uh, Jacques. So um, we're in a period of deepening and accelerating global democratic recession. Um, I think most of the ratings agencies, such as the Economist Intelligence Unit, Democracy Index, Freedom House, uh, 
are recognizing these days, The Economist uh, came out recently, Freedom House will come out next month, that you know Taiwan is actually one of the few democracies in the world where liberal democracy is becoming better and more liberal. Uh, this is not generally the trend in Asia, Japan, some kind of maybe incremental erosion. South Korea, some of us believe a lot more than incremental erosion. Uh, same, even more so with Mongolia, perhaps. Uh, and, you know, other liberal democracies have not been performing well. So democracy is now an asset for Taiwan. It has been for a long time, as you've noted in your writing, but now even more so. And uh, yet, uh, as China sinks its claws more into the UN system and the UN Human Rights Council, that doesn't seem to get Taiwan very far. So I'm wondering if you could comment on the extent to which Taiwan's shining and even improving democraticness is an advantage or a resource for its position in the world. And we know the story of the, US, of the US and how it's reacting, but I'm wondering if you might want to say something about how European democracies are reacting. Mm. Uh, a lot, a lot there, a lot of interesting uh, stuff. But yes, Taiwan is this example of, of improving democracy, and and uh, uh, you know you're you're you're, by, you're the expert on democratic recession, and, and you know it's one of the few uh, bright spots. And I, I think there's some reasons for that. Um, I think partly the uh, divisions within Taiwan over uh, cross-strait policy have receded a bit, and that was a very emotional um, uh, uh, source of the, the kind of conflict. Uh, partly Taiwan looks better by comparison uh, to much of the world. I mean, at this point, a couple of legislators that's uh, throwing a pig entrails around or hitting one another with chairs looks pretty tame compared to Washington. <laughs> so, yeah, that probably helps out. Uh, but I also think I also think the Hong Kong thing had a huge impact. I mean, the sense that the Taiwanese really have over the years increasingly self-identified as democratic. And what happened in Hong Kong after 2019, the national security law, the, 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 the violence used against the pro-democracy protests, that really, I think, reinforced and crystallized um, uh, that view. Um, I mean, you know, we can talk about things that aren't such bright spots, you know, is transitional justice a partisan thing, but, but by and large, a, a remarkable set of accomplishments. Does it help Taiwan? Um, you know, so the, if I'd had a 45 minute talk instead of a 30 minute talk, I would have said all these areas where Taiwan is playing to international values, be it human rights, law of the sea, climate, et cetera. Um, even though there have been significant gains, they're playing where the game is shifting adversely. So as you say, China's influence in the UN Human Rights Council, uh, which is leaning back toward a strong sovereignty, don't muck around in my internal affairs, going more toward cultural relativism, going more toward the collective rights of the people uh, rather than, uh, than individual human rights. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's playing a stronger card in a weakening game. That said, um, you know, I, I think China remains quite anemic as a, as a soft power actor, um, that, that there's a lot of governments that will sort of uh, kowtow in that direction. I think the publics are less keen on that. You can see this coming through recently in the response to uh, Chinese vaccines and COVID, you know, the, those being exported, you see blowback below the, the top level. So I, I think, you know, there still is a constituency out there. And to the extent that we have increasingly flawed democracies that are still democracies, I think it still resonates. I'm hopeful that the that Biden era U.S. foreign policy will swing a bit back more toward um, toward uh, counting uh, those those values. But um, if I were sitting in Taiwan, I would definitely be worried about the question you raised. The world doesn't care as much about democracy uh, on average as it did, and. Um, the U.S. is in relative decline, power-wise, vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, and uh, Trump was proof of concept that we can absent ourselves from our traditional roles. Uh, a lot of international institutions that have been supportive of those values have been weakened, and post-hegemonic maintenance of international institutions is not an easy trick. Um, and uh, even if the best of intentions are there in the Biden administration, um, I think it's it's going to be preoccupied with domestic things, and we are to get to the question you actually asked. Uh, we are we are at a point now where where the hoped for 
re-engagement with uh, Europe, uh, particularly in, in pushing back against China and to a degree against Russia, which gets outside my, my area of, of, of any expertise, uh, is proving surprisingly tough sledding. And it's, it shouldn't be that surprising, I guess, because you think back of what happened after Tiananmen, right? I mean, the US wanted to keep up the pressure a lot longer. So absent a US leadership role, it's really tough, even with one. There's a real Talleyrand tradition to European foreign policy that, that says we're not going to inquire too much about what goes on domestically. That said, it is still way better to be a thriving democracy than not. And I think Taiwan should play very hard the card of the expertise it can provide in democracy, the GCTF type things. And in particular, and I know you know this very well, Larry, that Taiwan has done a lot to stave off attacks on its democracy. I mean, the ability to deal with the misinformation uh, campaigns and the subversion efforts is, is really quite remarkable. Great. Um, so we've got a whole slew of questions coming in and I, I apologize in advance. We're not going to get to all of these or even most of these, but I'm going to try to combine two or three and piggyback on the previous conversation here and ask uh, if you as a, a Taiwan leader have to prioritize one domain in international relations to prior to to throw all your weight into, wouldn't it be the economic domain uh, rather than anything else? Um, in, in particular, because that's most important practically for Taiwan's long-term survival is to maintain a, a vibrant economy. And second, Taiwan has a lot uh, independently to offer to other potential partners in that domain. Um, and I've, we've gotten several questions about TSMC uh, and their growing relationship with um, uh, manufacturers in the U.S. And so the, the kind of strategic importance of Taiwan's economic assets. Um, so I'll, I'll try to, you know, uh, combine all of that into one question to, to toss over to you. <laughs> so look, I, obviously, the, the area in which Taiwan most punches above its weight is economically, right? It's a hugely dynamic uh, uh, economy, very cutting edge, technologically, major part of global supply chains, all that stuff. Um, and Taiwan has been more successful in carving out an economic space because it's not so fraught with this sovereignty type questions. Um, so in, in some sense, that makes sense. But, you know, leaders of, uh, of, of besieged uh, countries have to be able to walk, chew gum, blow bubbles, and repair their shoes at the same time. And, and so I, I think you really got to be both, and they're interconnected. Right? We've seen Taiwan leader after Taiwan leader after Taiwan leader try to figure out a way to minimize or at least ameliorate the political vulnerabilities that come with Taiwan's most natural route to economic prowess, which is engagement with the mainland. Um, so you know, that's always been a trade-off, and that's you, know, you can't sacrifice the economy, but Taiwan, more than most countries, has to worry about the Albert Hirschman nightmare of asymmetrical interdependence and, and exploitation. Um, so good economic policy is, is partly uh, geopolitics. The other thing to be said is that right now, as the US-China relationship gets as, as complicated as is, we do see some shifts toward decoupling, greater shifts toward uh, trying to uh, put higher fences around technology. Taiwan's got to figure out how to adapt to that. It's an important economic question, uh, but it's deeply bound up with this politics. So take TSMC, which you're referring to. I mean, TSMC, of course, uh, you know, very high-end uh, semiconductor uh, company and, and deeply uh, tied to Silicon Valley, deeply dependent in many ways on the access to that kind of US technology on which the US is now putting export restrictions. On the other hand, Huawei is a huge customer and that's public enemy number one in, in US uh, uh, policy toward, toward uh, Chinese technology. So I think, yes, the economic issues are hugely important. It's notable that Tsai Ing-wen has in both of her inaugurations, despite the fraud international environment, stressed economic issues, both growth and kind of economic justice at home. But you, the issues are just deeply entangled with the politics and the trade-offs are, are complex. But Taiwan's right to tout, I think, its strengths, but its strengths are economic, its strengths are also values, and I think you play both, both cards. Um, so I'm going to stretch your expertise in the other direction now. We've got a, a fairly detailed question about, in fact, I'll, I'll just read the part of this question that's relevant here, um, uh, about U.S. policy towards Taiwan. Um, this questioner notes that uh, 
he would add another component to your Taiwan policy canon, and that is Executive Order 13014, signed by President Clinton in 1996. Um, this is news to me. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to look at this EO, uh, the interpretation the questioner offers is that it delegates the functions of the TRA to the Secretary of State. Under the executive order, the Secretary of State can redelegate this authority as deemed appropriate to other bodies or entities. And so uh, what effect do you assess this particular executive order might have upon US-Taiwan policy, if any? As you're taking me back to my days working in the Office of Legal Counsel at the Justice Department, we used to deal with executive orders and, and I got all the things that had anything with possible Chinese language anywhere near it. Um, but you know, this this is a this is gets us into the whole you know unitary executive thing. So I, I think I don't think it does a whole lot ultimately. That is, no cabinet official or sub cabinet official is going to do anything on U.S. Taiwan relations. It's a big deal without clearing it with Jake Sullivan, Joe Biden, whomever. Right? You just don't go down that path. What that kind of executive order does do, however, is it allows us to do something like we talked about in the first question, which is if you want to make a little step down a somewhat iffy path, if you can put a lower level face on it, uh, that sort of helps. Um, but you know, uh, the executive, the unitary executive theory is now robust enough that that, that order uh, could be uh, overridden if one, it could be ignored if one felt that it, could, it felt like it could be changed by the president, and of course the actor actually making the formal decision is not going to go off script uh, from what's going on uh, higher up. But I think it's a very useful tool if you want to keep things uh, down to a certain level or if you want to make it operate at the working level or the specialty level. It's, it's a nice thing to have in the, in the, uh, in the repertoire. Um, so I want to uh, pick up on a, another point you made, which is that Taiwan's formal diplomatic, uh, for, formal the, the states that recognize Taiwan formally have formal official relations with Taiwan. Uh, that number is down to 15 countries. Um, does it matter if the number of countries drops down to single digits? I've actually heard US officials say that might be a kind of tipping point where the United States might have to intervene. Should we, could we stop uh, the remaining states from flipping to Beijing? and? Uh, isn't it hypocritical of us to attempt to intervene in that since we ourselves have made the switch and don't recognize the Republic of China on Taiwan as a sovereign state? Well, hypocrisy, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's part of politics, part of diplomacy, part of probably daily life. Um, yeah, of course it's hypocritical. Um, is, is, is 10 a threshold? I mean, it's a psychologically important threshold, I guess, single digits versus double digits, but um, you know, I think it is, as I tried to say in the talk, I think it's, um, there is no one magic number. Uh, but I think if you see, because people see 10 as a symbolic number, to go below that would be taken as a signal that Beijing may well be squeezing it down to zero and trying to take this entirely off the table. And since, again, there's not any hard and fast number, uh, the value of diplomatic allies to Taiwan declines if they get too small a number, which means the value to Beijing of taking them away, uh, you know, perhaps becomes more significant. Well, so 10 is you know, not a bad number, and it's probably a great idea to signal uh, by the US to Beijing that we would consider 10 as a significant threshold. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a somewhat uh, circular process. Um, what could we do? Well, we could do a lot of things. I mean, one of the few virtues of your diplomatic allies being small and poor um, is that they're dependent on a lot of um, outside support and assistance and vulnerable to pressure. Now, of course, the problem is China is now able to offer significant uh, cash inducements and diplomatic inducements uh, for, for parties to switch, so you can get into something of a bidding war. Uh, but we could certainly do, and you saw some feints in this direction with recalling the ambassador and with, with putting the squeeze on the Solomon Islands. They haven't been successful, and I don't see the U.S. you know dying on that hill particularly. And I think that I don't think we're going to. I, I think it would take a lot to do it, and I'm not sure what we have really uh, accomplished. And again, there's no signs we have done it. It's it's it's. I think the farthest we've gone is the Taipei Act's call for essentially carrots and sticks. Um, I think the better lever against Beijing on that is for Taiwan to say, you know, fine, you want to do that? We're just going to stop talking about that. We're going to talk about robust informal ties. And there the U.S. could, I think, signal in advance to China, if you squeeze too hard, 
we are going to take our informal ties right up to the brink of the kind of formal relationship you really would get ticked off about. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, again, we've got far more questions that I'm going to be able to get to today. So I apologize to the audience if I don't ask your question. Um, but I, I did want to ask uh, one other big, uh, in fact, this might be a good, uh, depending on how long you go, a good question to end on, which is, um, uh, so the, the new, new US administration, the Biden administration is likely to engage in some kind of review of Taiwan policy uh, over the next few months. And uh, so if you were advising them, uh, what would you suggest as the adjustments to US Taiwan policy? What are we likely to see change, if anything? Um, and in particular, would you keep or would you partly roll back uh, what uh, was kind of rushed through towards the end of the Trump administration in terms of uh, changes in U.S. policy towards Taiwan? Uh, and if you and let me let me uh, raise another piece of this: uh, Beijing is attempting to coerce Taiwan or put pressure on it through a lot of different means. Uh, one of the things that I would argue the the Pompeo move did is give us some leverage. If you want us to return to our previous position, Beijing, you need to back down in certain areas in exchange for that. And so there might be an opportunity for a kind of, uh, rather than a vicious spiral, a virtuous spiral, where we both readjust our positions in a way that enhances the stability of the Taiwan Strait. Yeah, so there, uh, yeah, there is obviously this discussion going on. Um, I would say a, a couple of things. One is I think that it's important to try to make progress on the economic relationship. Uh, the earlier question, the question you alerted, alluded to, that's important. I think we have an opening uh, to move forward on the bilateral uh, trade agreement or at least progress toward it. Um, so I took a unilateral risk there and I think it's important to, to reciprocate. Um, I, I think that um, we've got to be more attentive to gray zone problems, that is, uh, we've, we've had this scenario of, of possible military conflict and that could still happen, but I think we're now into political warfare on gray zone. That is the sense of coercive measures that don't quite cross the line, but are meant to intimidate. We've been paying more attention to that. But I think we need to think hard about what the, what the scenarios are, what triggers what. Um, and I think you need to be much more worried of political warfare type things, which is the, the sort of uh, surreptitious disinformation and, and the kind of leverage against companies and all that kind of thing. These are not new, but I think they're being used more aggressively. And I think our policies are a little outdated. Does that mean strategic clarity rather than strategic ambiguity? Maybe. Um, uh, so those, I guess, are, are the, the, the two things I, I would... Um, I would probably point to it starting as, as to the, 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 the thing you suggested about making trade-offs. I think there's a lot to be said for not saying we'll trade off that step in return for China giving us something. I don't think you want to go there. And I think one of the things the Biden administration is sensitive to is not doing too many horse trading deals, especially if they start crossing issue areas with China. Um, but I think you can say, look, we've got that authority. And I don't, yeah, I, don't think I don't think there's a very sophisticated understanding in China of what the legislation that we've seen go through means. And so I think you could signal we're not going to fully implement the Pompeo uh, lid lifting. We're not going to go with all the authority set forth in the 10 pieces of legislation, providing we can make some climb down and some progress here. Okay, great. Um... Larry, did you have any uh, follow-ups that you wanted to add here before we run out of time? Uh, no, uh, I think that uh, it's been a remarkably wide-ranging discussion uh, given the limits of our time. And I can't take notes fast enough because uh, Jacques has so much to say. And uh, I am, uh, I, I do think it's striking that uh, given how fearful Taiwan was, I think uh, people in Taiwan a little bit uh, extravagantly and unnecessarily so that the Biden uh, administration was gonna dial back a lot of the Trump administration uh, initiatives and more fulsome embrace of Taiwan it, it just it's, this is just a reaction to what Jacques has said. It's not a, not a question. It is just downright striking um, how little of the fear is um, 
is proving to have been founded. And it is further striking, think about all of the polarization in the United States now uh, on so many issues. And Taiwan is one of those issues. China is, I think, to some extent too. But the flip side, Taiwan even more so, where there is just striking consensus among Republicans and Democrats that we have a moral commitment uh, to, uh, you know, uh, ensure that this uh, democracy isn't browbeaten and coerced into having to change its status. So uh, I, I think Jacques has really kind of reinforced and clarified and help, help, helped us think about, um, you know, how this consensus might move forward. Great. Um, well, on that note, I think I will bring this to a close. We are just a minute away from our ending time. I do want to thank our audience for tuning in today. Once again, you've been listening to uh, the speaker series of the Hoover Project on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific uh, at the Hoover Institution, Stanford University. I've been Karis Templeman uh, with Larry Diamond and our, uh, our esteemed speaker today, Jacques Delisle from University of Pennsylvania Law School. Uh, it's been a delight to have you here with us today, Jacques, and uh, I hope you stay warm over there on the East Coast uh, where uh, you have our sympathies. Um, the last thing I'll say before I log off is that uh, our next event, we haven't announced it yet, but there's an event in the works for March 18th, where we're going to be looking at the state of media freedom in Taiwan. and. Uh, controversial decision to suspend a pro-unification uh, television channel uh, and the fallout from that decision. Um, so I invite you to tune in in a, a month from today, actually, on March 18th. Keep an eye out for announcements about that event. Uh, with that, thanks, Jacques. Enjoy your evening. Uh, and uh, good night or good morning to the rest of you out there in the world, wherever you may be. Mm -hmm.